Okay, cool, cool. I feel like I haven't seen you guys in a while. Uh, my name is Adam. If I haven't had the chance to meet you, I'm the lead pastor here. Um, my wife, Stacy, and I have been away for about, uh, gosh, almost four weeks now. Um, my wife, Stacy, was, uh, was pregnant, and um, we were almost to like the six-month mark, right? So she was uh, at 23 weeks, four days, my wife went into labor, and uh, she stayed pregnant for another two weeks. So we made it to 26 weeks gestation with our son. And on, uh, De- yeah, hallelujah, yeah, December 30th uh, of this year, this last year, my son Easton was born, uh, two pounds, four ounces. He's, he's alive, he's tiny, but he is mighty in Jesus' name. And so we've been in the Nick unit. And um, man, what a, what, a, what a season, what a way to, you know, end the year 2021 and then coming into 2022 uh, we've been at the hospital every day just watching this little guy grow and and so thank you for your prayers for those of you guys that have been uh, part of this journey you follow us on social uh um, this is one of those trials that you get to like let everyone in on you know it's like when you're going through like depression or anxiety you're not like hey guys pray for me. Life sucks right now. You don't do that. You just, you act, you just smile and you just tell a couple people, right? You, you have your people. But when you're going through something like this, the Lord told me like, this is where the church thrives. This is what we're for. We're here to go to bat for one another and we're here to pray heaven down into this little boy's life. So I'm just thankful for, as a dad, uh, I'm just so thankful. And as a pastor, I'm so grateful for a church that, that prays and uh, you guys pray and you guys believe that God is real and he works in prayer. So thank you for doing that. Uh, Easton is, uh, is, is, came real early, but he's going to be okay. He's going to be okay in Jesus' name. Hey, um, as we start this new year, I wanted to start off with uh, a series called Habits. Um, if you would have asked me a few years ago, like, about a New Year's series, I would have been like, I don't want to do something about goals or habits. I think that's, uh, cause I, I know about you, but like I start a lot of things. I start a lot of projects. I'm a great starter. I start so many things. I love starting projects. I love the idea of just starting something new. I love ideation. It's one of my top strengths. Like, oh, you know, it'd be awesome. Like I'm great. If you want someone to hype you up and get you to like help you believe that you can do it, I'm your man. If you want someone to manage that thing for you, I'm not your man, okay? Who, who are my non-managerial types in the house? Like you're great at starting, great ideation people, creative, you can design stuff, but like actually pulling the levers, you're like, no, that's not, my, that's not me, right? And so when I think about like new year, new me, who it is, like I think about all that we've gone through over the last two years, it's like, it's time for some big changes. Like we're gonna take 2022 by storm. And, and as much as I want to get up here and like give you that sermon, I, I gotta be honest with you. This is not my strength area. I'm really consistent at being inconsistent. I really am. I'm not, I did the Gallup Strength Finders test, okay? I know my top five. They're like, don't even look at your last, the other 30, whatever. Don't even look at that because then you'll be concerned about that. And what do you do when someone says don't do something? You do it, right? Yeah, you're like, "Don't, don't look down. You're like, oh gosh. And so I paid the extra 40 bucks or whatever for Gallup Strength Finders to find out what are my like, what am I terrible at? Like, what are the things I'm not good at? And <laughs> so I can hire to that end, you know? And so we can, like, I need someone to keep me organized. And what I found out is that, <laughs> no joke, consistency is my least strength. So when I think about habits, I get a little nervous because I'm like, man, God, I've read a lot of books about habits. I mean, I've read The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. I've read Atomic Habits by James Clear, which some of this content's coming from. I've spent a lot of time and invested a lot of energy into growing myself as a leader because I know like I have some shortcomings and maybe you've like taken some classes, you've taken, you've gotten some education, you've, you've read some books, you've listened to podcasts and you think about all this stuff and you know, you know how to get a six pack, you just don't do it. You, could, you know how to be financially secure and you know how to invest. You just don't always have the discipline to do that. You spend more money than you make sometimes and, you, and there's, you know, you're just not as disciplined. You, you could tell me how to do certain things, but when it comes to the rubber meeting the road, we sometimes, we miss out on not the big things, not the big goals. All those things are great, but what happens so oftentimes is that we don't develop the small habits that equal the big results. 
And so we want big change and we want like new year, new me. And we want all these resolutions and cool things and that's great, but it's not the, the big things that we have to be so concerned about. We should be more concerned about the little habits. And when I read this book by James Clear called Atomic Habits, something clicked inside of me. I've read it four times now. And every time I read it, it does something in me. It reminds me. It's like it puts something on my brain to, to focus not on the end result, but to focus on the leading indicators, the inputs, and letting the outcomes kind of leaving those up to God. And so I want to talk about this, but we're in a series called Habits, and this entire talk is kind of uh, centered around this idea that big results are simply a lagging measure of your small habits. Big results are simply a lagging measure of small habits. Now, let me get real practical for you as we jump into the new year. You guys ready? All right, cool. I'm glad you're ready or not. Okay. Your current weight is simply a lagging measure of your eating and exercising habits. Everyone wants to lose a little weight always. Like, I want to get healthier, want to get stronger, want to, you know, like get, you know, the summer bot, all that stuff, lose the, the, the Christmas holiday weight. Your decisions, the little tiny habits are actually what's impacting your weight. So your weight's a lagging measure of your eating habits or your exercise habits or lack thereof. Your, your financial situation is mostly a lagging measure of your spending habits. Come on. How many of you guys know right now, I, uh, Andrew mentioned last week that Blue Monday is coming up. Blue Monday is when you realize, oh, my New Year's resolutions aren't coming to pass and I've spent way more money on Christmas presents and your credit card bills come in about the 15th of the month and you open up that letter. And you know when you're little, all you want to get is mail. You're like, dad, when, when am I going to get mail? He's like, it's all bills, son. You're like, I want mail. And then you get older, you're like, oh, it's all bills. He's right. Dad, shout out to my dad. You don't want these, you don't want this kind of mail, son. Your clutter, this is for me, this is my, my garage is a mess right now. Your clutter is a lagging measure of your cleaning and organizational habits. Did you know that? Like the little things that you do every day to clean up, tidy up your house. Like there's always one person that's way more cleaner in every marriage. And that's my wife. She is organized. Like everything's organized. I, on the other hand, I'm okay. Like if the laundry's not done, it doesn't bother me as much. It just doesn't. I'll walk in the house and I'm like, hey kids, who wants to go jump on the trampoline? And Stacey's like, you just walked by a pile of stuff right there. You didn't see that. I'm like, I didn't even see it. Didn't even see it. I like my life. Like, it's great. It's a great life. Like, don't judge me. It's awesome. Like, anxiety low. Your character, your spiritual intimacy with God is actually a lagging indicator or a lagging measure of your spiritual habits. How close you are to God, your, the, the, the intimacy, the character growth, the principles that you're living by, all of that is actually a lagging measure of your spiritual habits. And I want to talk about habits for a few minutes Today, this whole series for the next four weeks, be here in the house every week. Come to this night of worship. Join us for 21 days of prayer and fasting. As a matter of fact, put that slide up. I'm gonna talk about this a couple of times probably. Um, text that word right now. We're all doing this, by the way, so welcome to church. Um, we're all gonna do this together. It's gonna change the way we interact with, with God. It's gonna change how we interact with each other. You're gonna get that little prayer and fasting guide sent to you tomorrow. Uh, it's a PDF, it's digital. You can print it out if you want to spend like $30 on printing. I don't care. Um, you, <laughs> we were going to give them all out to people and I calculated it up. I was like, oh, it's going to be like $8,000. So I didn't know. So um, text that word prayer to that number right now. Okay, we're all, you're not doing it. Do it uh, and do that. And guess what? Tomorrow you'll get a little reminder in the morning. We're not going to spam you for, from here on out till 2022 three, you know, next year, we're just going to send you just for the duration of 21 days of prayer and fasting. We'll send you a little text in the morning saying, Hey, today's prayer focus focuses this. You'll get the devotion sent to you so you can track along. And then every morning at about uh, at seven o'clock sharp, we'll jump on Facebook live. We'll virtually have a morning prayer. So you don't have to drive it. You could be in your PJs. No one will know. And you could just 
Tune in for five, 10 minutes, pray with us. We'll have a quick devotion, five, 10 minutes tops, and then we'll go on our way. And then we're gonna fast, okay? I'm fasting uh, this season, I'm fasting for my son, okay? My son Easton, um, here's what happens. Jesus said, sometimes these things require prayer and fasting. Sometimes fasting is the power that God uses to break through something and release something from heaven into this world. So whatever it is you're believing for, let me ask you, when's the last time, think about the thing you are asking God for the most right now, the person that you're believing for, the situation that you want to change. When's the last time you spent 21 days in a row focused on prayer and fasting, specifically asking God to move in that area? When's the last time you did that? What better time to start than tomorrow? Fast with me. I'm doing a Daniel fast. I know some of you are like, it's not a real fast. Well, whatever, judge me. Um, you can do a water fast and we can talk about that. That's, I've done a three-day water fast. That was hard. Um, but maybe I'll do that next year. But this year I'm doing a Daniel fast. That's just no meats. It's basically like, it's like a whole 30. You can Google it. Um, Daniel fast, it's real easy. But really the whole point is not to be a dietary person. It's not for me to, to lose weight. It's not for me to try to get healthier. The whole point is that we're turning off the, the physical so we can tune into the spiritual. So whether it's social media that you're fasting, except for Facebook Live at 7 a.m., um, <laughs> or if it's sugar or whatever it is, it's something that's gonna push you to prayer into the presence of God. Sound good? Okay, cool. All right. Zechariah 4.10. Zechariah's Old Testament prophet, he says this, the Lord says, who dares despise the day of small things? Israel was in a tumultuous season. They had just been, uh, they had, were coming out of captivity from Babylon. King Darius was like, hey, remember we did Daniel dilemma and, and, chap and Daniel basically is the story of, of the Israelites uh, being taken over by the Babylonians. The Babylonians were uh, like the Mede, they got, later on got taken over by the Mede Persians. And uh, you see this whole story take place, but the Israelites were in a season where they were going back into Jerusalem. They were gonna go rebuild the temple. And the temple is where they met with God. And it was this beautiful place at one point, but now it was a mess. It was completely uh, ruined and they were gonna rebuild the temple. They're like, hey, new year, it's a new us. We're leaving the old behind. We're, they got together and they're like, let's do this together. And they ran into some opposition and they became very discouraged. Because how many of you know, the minute you start trying to change something, the minute you start going after God, isn't it funny how all of a sudden it seems like things aren't going the way that you wanted them to go? It's like when you're just coasting, you're like, everything's good. And the minute you're like, I'm gonna read my Bible today. I'm gonna pray today. I'm gonna get up. I'm gonna go to Bible study. I'm gonna join a life group. I'm gonna join the serve team. And all of a sudden you're like, yeah, I'm doing great, God. And all of a sudden, boom, opportunity knocks and devil's like, I don't like this guy making progress. I'm gonna hit, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit him with something. Have you ever noticed that? And the minute you start making progress, that's when discouragement usually hits. And so these Israelites were, 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 were frustrated and God's basically saying to them, hey, through Zechariah, do you trust me? Then don't despise the small beginning because God loves it when he sees the work begin in, in this project, built, rebuilding the temple. And I would encourage you, Active Church, the same thing in 2022. Don't despise the day of small things. If you have a little bit of things to be, like one small little thing to be thankful for, give God thanks for that small thing. Don't look at all the stuff you have to do. Just look at the small thing that God is doing and don't despise it because God does big things through small little habits, and he wants to do something in your life in this year. This year, now, author James Clear. I talked about this book at the outset of the sermon. This book called Atomic Habits by James Clear. I recommend it. You should go buy it on you know buy it on Amazon. Uh, listen to it on Audible. Whatever, however you consume information, listen to this book. Read the book. It's really really good. Okay, and although he's not a Christian uh, author, he is. This is some very, very like deep psychological stuff that's written in such a way, in a non-scholarly way, scholarly way that you can totally take hold of and go, I can apply this to my life today. Check out what he says in this book, Atomic Habits. Quote, we often put pressure on ourselves to make some earth shattering improvement that everyone will talk about. Meanwhile, improving by just 1% isn't notable and sometimes isn't even noticeable. But, it can be just as meaningful, especially in the long run. In the beginning, there are basically, there's basically no difference between making a choice that is 1% better or 1% worse. In other words, it won't impact 
you very much today. But as time goes on, these small improvements or declines compound and you suddenly find a very big gap. Watch this. A very big gap between people who make slightly better decisions on a daily basis and those who don't. Here's the punchline. If you get 1% better each day for one year, you'll end up 37 times better by the time that you're done. Isn't that practical? And and isn't that so true spiritually? Like we we try to make these leaps and strides spiritually so we get real serious. It's like when you start working out again and you go buy all the pre-workout and you buy all the stuff and you go get some new gym clothes. You're like, this is my year. Some of you guys are there right now. You're like, yeah, every day, seven days a week, no days off, all day, every day. Protein, huh, you know? And you go hard for like 12 days and you're like, I've kind of make, I'm making some gains. And then you're like, I'm good. I'm good for a month. <laughs> what if you got 1% better this year in the area that God's asking you to grow in? What if it's like, what if you don't have to become this spiritual giant overnight? What if today is, marks the day you're like, today, I'm just going to read, I'm going to read one verse a day. I'm going to read one chapter in my Bible a day. It takes me What, how long does it take to read a chapter? A minute in your Bible? What if I just did one thing today spiritually to help me grow? What if I was 1% better than I was yesterday? What if your life is actually not, what if you just left the results like out the window and you just focused on getting better? Like what, like imagine every team on the NFL right now, what was their goal at the beginning of the season before playoffs? Make the Super Bowl, win the Super Bowl. Guess what? Everyone has the same goal. But what if the coach this year was like, all coaches were like, you know what? Forget it. We're not going to worry about winning the Super Bowl. We're going to worry about focusing on the behaviors of a winning team. What if they just focus on the behaviors and the systems and the practices and the defense and the offense? What if they just did that? Guess what? I think the results might come positive or negative, but they'd probably be a great team if they focused on behaviors of a champion. And the same is true for your walk with God. If you and I stop figuring, stop trying to figure out all the end results and just start doing the small habits with great obedience and discipline, our walk with God is going to get stronger and we're going to grow this year. I want to help us do that. So big results come from a buildup of small habits. I want to read to you out of 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 41. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 41. We see a story uh, in 1 Kings about a guy named Elijah. Elijah was a prophet and Elijah didn't have a good time. Elijah was under King Ahab. And if you know anything about Israel, he was the seventh king of Israel and he was not a bad, he was a bad leader. He was not a good king. He was a very bad leader. And, um, And what he did was, he had this moment where Ahab was worshiping all sorts of false gods. There was a pantheon of gods in, the, in Babylon and, and uh, I'm sorry, in this day and age. And so what he was worshiping is, was Baal. Baal was a false god that many of the, the people of this area were worshiping. And as you know, we're supposed to worship the one true God. No other gods before me. That's, that's the commandment, right? And Ahab was letting the people of God do whatever they wanted. By the way, parenting note, leadership note, (laughs) people will always drift towards towards disorganization. People, systems, businesses, nothing drifts towards health. Nothing drifts. You don't just wake up one day and go, oh my gosh, I got a six pack. How did this happen? (laughs) Oh my gosh, my finances are all in shape. Everything drifts towards chaos. So the job of a leader isn't to do everything. The job of a leader is simply to go, This is where we're going. This is why it's important. And here's why you should be doing this. And then the other job of a leader is to say, hey, when you're not doing this, hey, I got to show you something. You're not doing what you're called to do. This is why we do it. This is our principles. These are our values. You're not really exhibiting that. What's going on? A good leader simply says, "There's there's the goal, but we're not here. We need to figure out how we can get there. Ahab wasn't doing any of that. And Elijah was brought in because God always uses a prophet to speak when to, to God's people when, when they're going the wrong way. And Elijah calls out Ahab and says, hey, you're worshiping Baal. Remember Elijah called down heaven. 
and all the prophets of Baal were consumed. And it was like this huge, he killed all these prophets, like 450 prophets from Baal. He like murdered all, or he killed all these people. You're like, well, the Bible's crazy. Yeah, it's nuts. You should read it. And, and then he's like, all right, that's my God. And then, and then he found out uh, that, you know, um, he was going to get killed uh, by this woman named Jezebel and he ran and he got all depressed. Well, this is the point where there was a drought for three and a half years in the land. And Ahab was like, dude, I know you, Elijah. You're a troublemaker. I don't like you. And here's what Elijah says to Ahab after three and a half years of drought. He tells him, hey, there's going to be rain. Watch this. Go eat and drink for there is a sound of heavy rain coming. So Ahab went off to eat and drink and he and it, watch this. And Elijah climbed up to the top of Mount Carmel, bent down to the ground and put his face between his knees. Go and look towards the sea, he told the servant. And he went up and looked. There's nothing there, he said. Seven times, Elijah said, go back. The seventh time, the servant reported, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising up from the sea. <laughs> So Elijah said, okay, go tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot, go down before the rain stops you. A little tiny cloud, all clear skies, it's hot, there's no rain, it hasn't been rained for three and a half years, and all he sees on the seventh time is a little tiny cloud the size of a man's hand, and that was enough for Elijah to go, boom, God's answering his prayer, this prayer. He's gonna, he's gonna bring rain, go tell Ahab, the rain is coming. And Ahab hears this and he's like, I have no idea what you're talking about, bro. He's like, rain? I don't, I don't see any rain. He's like, go and drink. There's a heavy rain coming. And Ahab's like, bro, you're tripping. There's no, there, it's been a drought for, th for, for three years. There's no clouds in the sky, Elijah. You're crazy. Get out of here. And so he goes and he, and he goes off. And here's what happens. Here's, here's how you kind of go from, from, I want to, kind of read the rest of the story, but I'll, I'll tell you how, here's the question. How do you go from a place of drought to a place of downpour in your life? How do you go from a place where there's no clouds in the sky, there's no rain and it feels empty to a place of downpour and blessing? How do we do that in the word of God? Here's what it says. So number one, write this down. If you're taking notes, by the way, take some notes. It helps you digest some of this stuff. You can go back later and you can do it on your phone. I know everyone has a notes app, right? So, uh, but if you're any, any old school note takers on the house, where are you at? Thank you. God bless you guys. Thank you. Yes. We got a lot of, yeah. The pen and paper is on a comeback. Come on. <laughs> Number one, write this down. How do you go from a drought to a downpour? Number one, decide what will be the center of your life. There's power in decision. Here's why. Expectation will determine how you experience things. Your expectation determines experience. I know this to be true. When I expect God is, I'm like, I know you're at the center of my life and I expect you to move, God. I expect you to, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you in faith to move. Then I've already pre-decided what's gonna be at the center of my life. So I make my decisions. I don't always feel like it. Now that's different. Feelings are not faith. Sometimes I feel like giving up. Sometimes I feel like quitting. I, oh, it sucks. But God, I'm like, but God, you said, you promised me. So I go back to this place where God's at the center of my life. So decide, you have to decide today, if you wanna go from a drought to a downpour in, in this year and, and experience God's presence, experience the rain. Rain always represents blessing, the presence of God, water. How you experience God will be determined by what you put at the center of your life. So make that decision today. Um, whenever you make big decisions, something or someone will be guiding that decision. So for example, if pleasure is at the center of your life, then you will make all of your decisions based on what is gonna bring you the most pleasure. If comfort is your heart's purpose or your dominating life principle, then you will make, your core motivations will be to make decisions based off of what's gonna bring you comfort. Does that make sense? Same with safety, uh, money, control, all these things. If whatever it is, whatever's at the center of your life, when things are going bad or when things are going the way that you didn't want them to go, 
you, if you don't have Christ at the center, you won't have a strong core to stand firm when everything comes your way. You'll be washed away. So God's saying, decide today, what, make a decision now what you're going to be leaning on when the trial comes because something will come. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And when the days of, of trials come, you have to decide right now, I'm going to make God the center of my life. So what's going to be at the center? Elijah made that decision. And watch, he didn't have to worry about the rain and about whether or not God was going to provide. He just had to keep putting God at the center of his life and keep praying and keep staying in that, that secret place with God every single day, meeting with God, connecting with God, praying to God. And the results were simply a lagging measure of his daily habits. He had little habits daily that gave him and pointed him in the right direction. Does that make sense? It was the daily things that Elijah did that helped him connect with God. Watch this in 1 Kings 18, 21. Elijah challenged the people. A good prophet always challenges people. That's what he's, that's why he's called a prophet. He's called to challenge the norm. He says this, how long, Israel, how long are you going to sit on the fence? If God is the real God, Follow him. If it's Baal, follow him. Watch this. And he says, make up your minds. Make, like, like determine who it is you're going to follow Israel because if it's God and he really is God, then you need to drop all this Baal worship and focus on Yahweh. But if it's not, then follow Baal. But don't be on the fence because he, here's what he knows. Elijah knows this. There is no power in a Christian walk, in a follower of God. There is no power, there's no stability when you're straddled on two things on a fence. There's no power. Anything can push you over. Because there's no balance, there's no, you have no sturdiness. But when you're rooted in, the, in, in God and you're planted firmly on God's foundation, you can take a lot more beating. You can take a lot when you're planted in God. So the, then it begs the question for us, for you. If God is God and you believe that, is he at the center of your life? Do you make decisions based off of not like what's in it for me, but like what would please God? What would glorify God the most in this? When you make big decisions, are you saying, God, you're at the center or is it like whatever I feel like in the day I'm gonna do? And, what, and if God, if he's along for the ride, I'll ask him to bless what I'm already doing. Cause that's what we do sometimes, right? He says, make up your minds. I see this happen all the time. Sometimes we're at, we're at church on Sundays and we worship God and, and we really, really do love him. But here's the, here's, the, here's the challenge. When we're not at church or we're not feeling close to God or we, he's not moving in the way we thought we were, he's gonna move, do we take over control again and try to do things our way and say, God, I'm, I'm good, I got this. Like, please leave me alone. I, I, don't, want, I don't need you right now. Do we, do we surrender our lives to God sometimes? And I think sometimes we live in that place where the minute our worldview is challenged or our proclivities or some, God disagrees with something in our life, we're like, well, I feel like this, this is my truth, God. God's like, well, there's one truth and it's, it's my truth. That's what God's saying. And I think, some, I think so often we, 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 we're guilty of this, uh, even in the American church, of cherry picking things that we like from scripture and creating a Jesus that fits our own worldview, but we don't actually ever end up surrendering our entire lives to the God of the Bible. We end up creating a God that fits what we like to do. And I, I'm here to tell us this morning, like God isn't like a buffet, <laughs> okay? You got to get to, like, I love buffets. Any, anyone with me? Like, you're already hungry. You're like, yes, I love buffets. No, I'm not talking like a hometown buffet. I'm talking like I lived in Las Vegas. I was a youth pastor for six years in Las Vegas. I know about some good buffets, okay? The Red Rock buffets, be, the feast, so good. Rio's pretty good too. When you go to a buffet, you don't have to eat all the stuff there. The best part about it is like at the Rio buffet, you can go to different parts of the world. Like, oh, come to Asia, come to, you know, Great Britain. And <laughs> just kidding. Um, there's no good food in Europe, uh, in England. Uh, <laughs> Bang is a mash. No, no. 
Mexico. I mean, Mexican food. Yeah, there we go. My favorite, the crab legs. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to camp out at the crab legs. You can have all the spaghetti and all the carbs. I'm going to eat all the crab legs and the butter. Okay, that's where I'm at. Because I can pick and choose when I go to a buffet. Because, but, when, but like at our house, we ha- we're so godly. Um, we have a rule in our house for dinner. You want to know what it is? It's a little saying, actually. You get what you get and you don't. Thank you. If my kids could just understand this. I don't want to eat that. Sorry, that's what's for dinner. Like in my house, like we legit are like, we're ruthless. We're just like, you're going to be hungry then. (laughs) Like you have no food intolerance. Eat this. This is dinner. And they eat it or they don't. And they, I'm like, you can fix, you can find some cereal or whatever. I don't care. They're old enough where they can get cereal. Praise God. Now we got one more. He, He needs to be fed. And that's like funny and all, but like, that's like God. See, when you gave your life to Jesus, he forgave you of all your sins. And it's amazing because he's the God that can save and he's the God that can do miracles and he's the God that can raise from the dead and he can restore your entire life. And that's the best part. You're like, I need a God to save me. But he doesn't just want to be your savior. He wants to be the Lord of your life. So it means that when you go to a crossroads, like, well, I could go this way, but it's not really God's way. You go, I I can't choose that. I feel like that, but I'm choosing to surrender to God. Even though it doesn't feel good in the moment, this is what God wants for me because this is true. I can't pick and choose what I like and what I don't like about God. Either he's God or he's not. Either he's at the center of your life or he's not. That's, 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 that is the... That is the message of the gospel. I deny my flesh and I turn to Christ. I'm imperfect. I'm a sinner and I fall short every single day. And when I'm called out and when I'm like, when people say, hey, bro, I need you. This is what I see. I'm going to be repentant. I'm going to say sorry when I need to. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn from sin. I'm never going to get it right on this side of heaven, but I'm going to keep pursuing God. And when my life doesn't line up with scripture, I don't get to pull out the page of the Bible and go, well, screw that one. I don't want to play that one. That one's, that one's bad. That one's dumb. God, you're dumb. No, I go, oh my God, I repent, Lord. And I know this is hard and it's hard to do this. And I wish I could just pull that, but I have to change my life to fit scripture, not the other way around. That's why Jesus said the road to destruction is wide. It's, it's a eight lane highway. It's easy. But the road, man, but the road to life, everlasting life, like it's narrow. If you will find it, Jesus is saying the world's ways, it's easy. Do whatever you want. But man, if you want to do it God's way, it's, it's narrow. It's, it's, the, it's the Jesus way, but it's better. It's better. Living God's way is better. I'm telling you, from experience, I've done it my own way and I've done it God's way. It's better done God's way. God's people were mixing worship. Baal some days, God some days. He's like, no, don't do that. And sometimes we put things in the center of our life and that doesn't work out so good. How did Elijah know that it was gonna rain? He was putting God first and he spent time with God daily. Watch this, 1 Kings 18. After a long time, in the third year, that's a long time for no rain, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Go and present yourself to Ahab and I will send rain on the land. Pause, could you imagine no rain for three and a half years? Just a drought, everything's dying, all the crops are dead. Some of you, we, like, we don't make our own food, we don't grow our own food. Like we would just like, we th- thank God for the farmers in the house, but like we, we don't, we, we don't. You don't have a micro garden in your backyard. And if you do, you're like, I got a pepper. This is awesome. <laughs> Look at these tomatoes. But like that lasts a little bit and then it's gone. But there's little to no food. It's dusty. It's miserable. Have you been in a season like that with the drought in your life? Not a physical drought, but a spiritual drought. Has 2021, last 18 months, two years, has it been felt like a drought for you? You're not alone. 
You're here because you know that there's something outside of you. God wants to do something in you. And so you're here and we have questions and we're leaning in. And God's saying, like, if you want to make it through a drought, there's some things you can do. But it's going to start with small habits. It's going to start with small behaviors. It's going to start with changing the way you view God and the way you view yourself. 1 Kings 18.42 goes, goes on. So Ahab went off to eat and drink. The band can come up. But Elijah, watch this. He, he climbed to the top of Mount Carmel, bent down to the ground and put his face between his knees. Pause. There's a contrast here. There's no rain for three and a half years. There's a small cloud. King Ahab go, hears the news and he, instead of going to God, what does he do? He goes off to eat and to drink. And then watch what, a, what Elijah does. Instead of drinking, he goes off to pray. What a contrast. One person gets news, heartache, trying to figure out what's going on with life. And Ahab, because his dominant life principle was pleasure, he went to go drink to anesthetize the pain of reality. And he went to go drink, so he wanted to escape whatever it was, the reality of life. He didn't want to deal with the pressure of life anymore. And Elijah, the man of God, went to the Lord in prayer and asked God to continue to move. And it's so interesting where we go when we feel pain, because where we go, listen, we've all been there. We've all, been, we've all ran to something we shouldn't have. We've all done something we shouldn't. When we feel pain, we're triggered. We go back to things that feel comfortable. And I'm here to tell you, this year, God's saying, when you feel like the pain coming on, instead of going to the things you once went for, like King Ahab going to a drink and getting the familiar feel of a buzz so he can just manage the stress of life, how many of you know that doesn't work out? It feels good for a minute. There's a reason why you drink. It feels good. And you drink more. And all of a sudden it's not feeling so good. And you drink too much and you're sick. And you do that for a few years and see how that works out. You do that for a few months and see how that works out. Eventually you're gonna go, I'm sick of this stuff. If you're abusing it, you're gonna go, I'm sick of this. This is not helping. And nothing wrong with having a drink. I'm not, this is not, that's not the sermon. I'm not saying you can't have alcohol. I'm saying be wise, be careful. But man, did you know you can't overdo it on prayer? I've never met anyone that says, you know what, dude? I've been praying and reading my word so much. I feel like crap. Nobody. No one's like, I just can't do this anymore. You wake up, you're like, I woke up early. I drank coffee. I read my Bible. This is great. Why? For such things, there is no law. <laughs> I preached that through... Five, months, five weeks ago now, feels like five months. Why? Because the fruit of the spirit, there is no law. You don't need a law telling you you can't have more hope. You don't need a law saying, hey, easy there with the patience there, buddy. You don't need laws to tell you to th do things that are the fruit of the spirit. Why? Because that's what God created you to do. He he, you are wired to influence the heart of God through prayer. Did you know that? You are designed to, to, to pursue God and to know him intimately. You're designed to have connections with people. And the more closer you are to God, the small little daily habits of prayer and fellowship and connecting with God, you are gonna see a big, big outpour in 2022 if you place God at the center of your life and if you make those small habits a priority. Don't despise small clouds. The seventh time the servant reported a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising up from the sea. So Elijah said, hey, go tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops. It, the rains are coming, Ahab. It's like a little cloud. And Elijah's like, no, I see this through the lens of faith. There's going to be so much rain pouring down because my God is a God that keeps his promises. That's what Elijah's saying. God had told him already, there's going to be rain. He promised it. It may have been a few years ago, but he goes, I'm still not giving up on the promise from God. Here's what I'm here to tell you. I'll close with this. Don't give up on the promises of God. Did you know there's over 7,000 promises in God from God in his word? 7,000. Pick one. Pick one. Just pick anyone. And my God will never leave me nor forsake me. 
that nothing can separate me, separate me from his love, not height nor depth. There's nothing on all creation that can separate me from God's love. That's a promise from God. So your job this year is to, to hold on to the promises of God and stop looking for the big things and just look for the little cloud. Don't despise the little thing in 2022. God's doing something big, but it's gonna start very, very small. Rain is coming. I don't know, I don't know what you've been through this last, last year. I know I've been through, gosh, 2021 was a hard year for, for us. But we're not giving up. I hope you join us for the next few weeks. I hope you allow the Holy Spirit to begin to stir up faith inside of you. I hope you allow this season of 21 days of prayer and fasting to begin to, to impact the way that you see God, that those little habits done with great obedience, that you would acknowledge that God is in those little things, that he's gonna do a big thing. And here's my last point. Don't give up before the downpour. First Kings 18, 43 says, go and look towards the sea, Elijah told the servant. And he went up and he looked. Nothing there. Seven times Elijah said, go back and check again. Go back and check again. Go look again. Go take another look. He's like, dude, it's four or five times now. Go again, go again, go again. Finally, he sees, he goes, there's a little cloud. Boom, that's all I need. Elijah didn't quit. So don't quit. You're like, well, it's been hard. This relationship is hard. This walk with God is hard. No one knows that I'm, I'm feeling lonely. Don't quit. Get in, get in a life group. Join a team. Take a step towards God. Come back to church next week. Bring a friend. Bring, don't quit. And some of you are gonna, if you quit now, you're gonna miss out on a downpour. If you stop connecting with God daily, maybe some of you have left God behind. You're like, I haven't really prayed much. I haven't read my Bible much. Some of you stopped praying in 2021. Or you, maybe you didn't stop believing in God, but you stopped believing God. Maybe you didn't stop believing that there is a God, but you stopped believing that he can still do miracles in your life. I'm here to tell you, don't quit because the greater pain in your life means the greater breakthrough. God's gonna come through in 2022. But here's a reality. You can't do this on your own. You can't do this with willpower. Like atomic habits, great. James Clear, awesome. Is that anointed? No, it's just a, just a good, good book. It's got some great life hacks in it. It's got some really cool principles that are true. But do you know, like reading a book like that isn't gonna save you, isn't gonna get, but you know what it can do? It can spark something in you that gives you the ability to see God working in your life. And it can give you some tools, but I'm here to tell you, the only way that you can do this thing called Christianity, the only way you can do it is not by willpower, but it's by the spirit of God living in you. So you have to make a choice. I'll go back to this first question I asked, who? or what is at the center of your life today? Because if it's not God, if it's not Jesus, none of this is gonna work. Will you believe with me today that God is gonna to begin to work? There's rain coming in 2022 if we don't give up. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the story of Elijah. I thank you, God, that we don't despise the day of small things, Lord, because it's the small things it's the small things that add up. It's the little things that we do, the 1% daily, getting better, getting closer to you, understanding who you are more, praying daily, the spiritual habits, God, that are gonna help develop us into the people that, that will be. And so, Father, I pray that you would move mightily in our church this, over this next 21 days of prayer and fasting. Would you begin to release some things into our church, release some vision, some release some ministry, God. I pray that you'd free up some people, Lord, that don't feel like they deserve or they feel undeserving of your love. Lord, would you break those chains in Jesus' name? Would you begin to pour out your love in our community, in our city? Our, our city needs hope. 
Our communities need hope, not fear. We need to know that God, you're working in our behalf. So this, this season, Lord, would you move in a mighty way in our church, in our community? And right now, I just wanna to speak to those that are, when, you, when I ask that question, who or what is at the center of your life? You'd say, you know what, I, it's not God. Well, guess what? Today's a new day. You get to put God where he needs to go, right in the center of your life, number one. If you're here today and you wanna place Jesus Christ, place your faith in him for the finished work on the cross, you wanna give, surrender your life to Jesus. Maybe you believe in God, but today's the day you're, you're here to surrender your life to God once again, or maybe for the first time. If that's you and you're here today and you wanna place your faith in Jesus with eyes closed, heads bowed, the best way you know how, Today, I want you to put your faith in God. Will you place your faith in Jesus? That's the question. Will you make him the Lord of your life? Will you make him the center of your life? If that's you on the count of three and you're saying, that's me, pastor, pray for me. I just want you to raise your hand. I'm not gonna embarrass you. I just wanna, wanna pray for you. On the count of three, pop your hand up if that's you. One, two, three. Say, that's me right here. Amen, amen, amen. God sees your hands. Amen, that's awesome. It's so good, amen. Amen, seize your hand. Yeah, it's awesome. God sees your hand. So good. And church, let's pray this together. I want you to repeat this after me if you raised your hand. Even if you didn't, just pray this with us as a church. Nobody prays alone here at Active Church. Say this prayer after me. Say this, Heavenly Father, thank you for saving me. I confess I'm a sinner. I've fallen short. But today, I receive your forgiveness. I surrender my life to you. Jesus, you're my Lord and you're my Savior. Send your spirit into my heart. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Can we give a round of applause to everyone who made that decision?